Okay, then. So I started. At, um, let's see. I played recorder at six. I played a uh, trumpet at six as well. I started playing guitar at twelve, something like that. I went to um, just an ordinary school. I went to music college at eighteen, just taking trumpet. I did a music degree for four years. Um, trumpet for my first study. And I left there, and then I thought trumpet was shit, so I stopped doing that. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to be a metal band. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be. A, that's my complete dream to be a huge metal band star. So I just did metal bands for you know, quite a long time and got nowhere. Um, I played in lots of other bands on trumpet as well. So I was a solo funk band for like seven or eight years. So I basically spent from 20 to 33 just in bands. I never, never had a job in my life. And it kind of all came to a big end and all the bands I played for sort of um, just fell to pieces. And I was like, oh my God, I want unemployment. And, you know, I was, on a, I was on an unemployment for sort of off and on for 10 years really with bands and stuff. And Robin Beeland, who worked at Rare at the time, he was a good friend of mine. He'd been at Rare about a year and a half and he was doing kidding sticks on the arcade. Said, look, why don't you try and do what I do? So he, he recommended that I buy a Proteus FX synthesizer, um, a clipboard, a company key base, an Atari ST with one mega frame, uh, and um, a black and white monitor with Cubase. So I didn't have any black and white in those days. And I just started writing tunes and sat in my bedroom at home thinking, you know, I'll do this for a career, it's going to be easy. Um, so I spent about a year doing that, and I sent five cassette tapes off to Rare over, over the course of that year. Because Robin worked there, and I thought after whether I didn't know what anywhere else. And um, out of the blue, I never got a reply for anything that I sent off. I got a reply saying, please come for an interview and bring some pieces of work with you. And the record said, can you do me a, a guitar based fighting piece? I was thinking of two at the time. Some kind of platform piece and something else. And so I kind of sat in my bedroom, wrote this piece of music, turned up an interview, you know, Dave Wise interviewed me. Uh, and um, that was it. And then as I was on a Friday, boom, you got that, so you got the job. I was like, oh my God, you know, I've never had a job in my life before. Um, I got to I get, I said, get paid, can't believe it. So I had to move down to Rare, I started in 1995. Uh, when I first got there, my first job was to do, um, convert Dave Wise's tunes from Donkey Kong 2 on SNES to the Game Boy. Um, and I'd been doing MIDI files and stuff, you know, at home and writing re music sort of thing. Um, and then it, it was all in hex, it was like, I don't know if you know what hex is, but hex is just like black and white screens. I don't know what hex is very well. Four numbers, like the first two numbers of the note, the second two numbers of the length, something like that. And the Game Boy had like three channels of notes and one channel of noise. And I was like, oh my god, I can't, and Dave started, this is, this is how you do it. That was it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was like, oh my god, it's a good life to go then. I just thought, Christ, I can't, this is so hard, I can't do it, I've got no idea what I'm doing here. So I really thought I have to quit, really. So the first day I spent, some of you know, crying. Uh, and then, um, so probably not, I just, I just don't understand this at all. I said, well, get Dave back. I told him to do it slowly. So I got Dave back the next day. I wrote it all down for today's he's bloody tapped like millions of keys. And so that's what I did. I, said, I spent, I just listened to his tunes and just, I, I didn't have the mini files. I just listened to it and tried to work out what he was doing and then just put it to the Game Boy. I actually quite enjoyed that, I mean, even though I hated it at the start. And then, so half, that was, I started on, on October, and halfway through that, um, Graham Norgate was doing Goldeneye and Blastcore at the same time. So look, I'm a bit busy. Well, why don't you take over Goldeneye for me? I went, oh, that sounds quite novel. So um, uh, I got an SGI computer, which was very flashy in those days, and um, he sort of showed me how to work it. And then, so off you go. So I didn't really know what I was doing. I had no idea to sort of use the Bond theme, because I didn't have the license to use the Bond theme. So this kind of did. You know, as many tunes as I could, and as many stars as I could. I never actually saw the game very much, because it was, it was such a shit piece of shit in those days. Um, I never got good until the last six weeks, really. It was a dreadful bit. Um, and so I never really looked at it much. I kind of did some sound effects. And that was, that was a new thing to me. I never did a sound effect I liked before. And then, um, first tunes for Goldeneye, and da -da 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 -da. I remember one day, it was like half eight at night, and uh, the Chris Tampo and the main brothers turned up with like several Japanese people who I didn't really know who they were and sort of walked in and said, um, right, Grant, give us some pipes and cheese, please. It was, it was Mr. Aaron Cowher, who was the head of Nintendo in America that time. I didn't know who he was. I was like, oh, who are these people? So I sort of picked a few tunes, I was sort of nodding away and they wandered off and I was like, oh, that was quite nice. Um, um, a little bit more of that, I'll probably put them up about Christmas probably, I was doing that, I think. I did the Game Boy to Christmas. Like, the deal was I did Game Boy in the morning and I'd go there in the afternoon, that's about my, that was my deal. So I did that. And then Christmas came and went, and I was really enjoying it, it was great. And in halfway through the next year, I think, I can't remember the exact timeline, but Tim Stamper turned up with this young guy, this young guy who didn't know who he was. And Tim sat on the floor, and this young guy sat on the chair. I thought, my God, the boss is sitting on the floor. Um, yes. 
Oh, sorry. Is that better? Sorry. Is that better, gentlemen? Ladies? Yes. Yeah, yes. Much better. Right, sorry. I said, rock and roll, you seem to come on! <laughs> um, right, okay. So, um... Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Tim's on the floor, this other guy's out of the chair, and I thought, oh, my God, if Tim's sitting on the floor, who's this guy in the chair? Because we're really, really important. I didn't know who he was. And he just said, look, just play, play some cheese ground, please. So I played, went to the Golden Eye Cheese, and I said, yes, okay. And I said, we'd like to come work an hour again. I said, oh, I was, well, you know, I'm not going to be Golden Eye yet. I'm going to finish that up. He said, no, you can work an hour game now. It's like that. I thought, oh, my God, it was great males who sat in the chair. And I was like, oh, so I had to tell the Golden Eye boys that I was no longer doing that. Because I didn't realise that he was, he was a boss, it was a big deal, I was like, oh, you know, I was doing the same. So, um, at that point, it was, uh, it was called Project Dreams, uh, it was on the end of Super NES, and Dave Wise was doing the tunes for it. Uh, so, um, the deal was me and Dave would share the music, the, the, the work on Dream, and then, you know, so, um, started doing that, um, and then Dave got pulled away to do Diddy Kong Racing, and I got given Dream to do by myself, uh, which was quite for me to be my first, you know, by myself completely. Um, so that was going on quite nicely. It was like a bit of an RPG sort of thing, and a, you know, a lot, a lot, quite a lot of music for that, and a lot of sound effects. And then at the same point, Conker's Bad Fur Game was going on, it was called something else. And that looked great, it looked much better than Dream. We had this really elaborate system in Dream, you could pull the floor up and down, and all these polygon stuff, it was fantastic, but the N64 couldn't run it, it was sort of powerful enough. And Dream was supposed to be on, it then moved from the, from the Super NES to the N64 with that bulky drive for the 64 DD that the track that was supposed to be in, and that was SNES chip inside it. So it was supposed to be, it was supposed to go on that, and all that stuff. Anyway, so Dave left, and I was like, oh my god. And then, then because Conker was going so well, and Dream would look great, but it didn't run. Um, we had a decent demo, actually, it was quite nice. Um, and then, it, Tim said, look, this is not going very well, it's a change. So I said, oh, it's big, I did like 110 PC music for that game, something like that. And then he said, we're changing it all, we need to make it a platformer, you know, uh, uh, and look, look at Conquer, Conquer was great, but I thought, oh my god, so we just chased their system, like, kind of, um, the way they did it was much faster. The traditional kind of, you know, Mario sort of looking thing, you know, or not as quite as in depth as the dream was. Um, and then, so, I, because it was going to be a platform game, I had to, to dump all of these because it wasn't going to fit, it was too, it wasn't going to be platform or So then, Tim said, we need to, we need to have a, an animal for the lead character, right? It could be an animal. So, when we looked at the character, it was a rabbit for a while, and then turned to a bear. And then he said, um, to them, why don't we call them the creatures um, after instruments? So the plan was to band you the bear, and um, the sister was called, I think she was called Pinky on the start, changed to TT after that, I think it was. And then the plan was to have a backpack, and then Kazooie turned up. She just kind of showed up. Well, yeah, well, yeah you know, they just kept putting on ideas, you know, that about what to put in the backpack. I think the bridge was supposed to be like, to have to carry implements, you know, using the game. And it was, Put the bird in there and it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it all got a bit carried away. Uh, and so that's, that Banjo was sort of born at that point, really. So um, and the first piece that I wrote was Click Clock Woods. So I wrote that kind of, I think it was the spring side of Click Clock Woods, so I just wrote off, off the top of my head without seeing the game much really. Um, and kept that piece around. But that piece really isn't, isn't very indicative of how Banjo really was. It's much more jolly, kind of, uh, kind of one was mountain y sort of, you know, the swamp, that kind of odd ball. What I came to in the end with him. I did that for a little while, uh, Banjo was going well, came out and seemed to be alright, all that. They just got four million sales, and I was like, oh my god, I can't believe it. But don't forget that Go had done 10 million by that point. It was like, you know, how on earth did this game get to sell 10 million? It was so bad when it came up, but it was just about to get released. We all thought it was to be a disaster. Um, but it was like, it just kind of went to sort of limp dance, but kind of went just a slow burn, it just got like, oh my god, it's a definitely cool. I'd read tunes for like a minute long, so you could spend like hours and levels, and the same tunes going on and on and on and on. <laughs> and I didn't realise that's what you're supposed to do that really. And like, the, there's, uh, it's a useless thing the game, but it's a bit me in the forest somewhere, I think, that, and that on a top woman turns up, and it's, I'd written the ambiences were all triggered by MIDI files, and I'd had this basic forest ambience, and just a big long set of notes, it went right through the MIDI file, and it started, and came back and started again, but I didn't realise that you press pause in the game. There was no new MIDI note on command to re the ambience. He paused it and went back, it was completely silent. <laughs> so it was like a big forest, absolutely not a, not a sound. Like, you know, that's where it went out, so I don't know. Um, anyway, so Banjo, Banjo, Banjo came out and on again, so we'll do Banjo 2. Um, and at that point, Graham Norgay, he's had to leave with the Free Radical guys and go for the Radical. And he was doing um, Perfect Dark and something else, Jet Force Gemini. So it was decided that I would take on Jet Force Les, Perfect Dark, 
Robin being number take on Jeff Ross-Jammer, so that's how we split like that. So I was doing magic two at that point, and Jeff Ross and uh, Jeff Dan. And then unfortunately, there was a girl called Evelyn Fisher who had done some work on Donkey Kong Country, on turn three, was doing music on Donkey Kong 64, and they didn't feel she was quite up to it. Evelyn said he's a good composer, but just wasn't quite a master out of the game. So they said to me, why do you do that as well? I said, oh yeah, that's, that's a great idea, yes, I'll do that, yeah. <laughs> so I was doing Badger 2 here, Document 64, Perfect Down, all that same year, which is quite a bit low that really. Um, so, um, did those, linked through all of them, to, you know, did, did the Deacon app, of course, did one of those, of course. Uh, and um, that was that, you know, I did that, had that great, and then I think it was probably getting close to the time of uh, the Microsoft buyout, so I don't know if you know the details of the deal, and Nintendo owned 49% of Rare, and the deal was after three years, it either bought the whole company, or the sell the shares to somebody else and give it up. That's how it went. So when it came to the buyout time, Nintendo offered 80% of the money to simply buy it from or give the rest of the money in shares, something like that. They didn't want to complete about the company. Tim Stamper said, I don't want to do that. So they started looking for other deals. Microsoft and Activision both offered money for Rare. And it was touch and go who was going to get it at the end. I think quite a lot of companies wanted to go with Activision because it would have been multi-platform. We could have got on everything which would have been great for, for Rare. But then Microsoft offered such a lot of money. It's like, you know, oh my God, that's, that's a fact instead. So um, I was a shareholder at the time, so I did vote for Microsoft, and I was like, I can't believe it. I can't be, you know, even though it's a bad idea now, I can't really uh, moan about it too much. I got money out of it. Um, so Ed Freeze was head of Microsoft Game Studio at that point in time. He was a great gamer and role, I took a lot. They thought it would be great to um, be with him, because he was a good guy. Uh, so, um, but unfortunately, just after we did the deal, he left. He so I was First game was grabbed by the Google is course on Xbox, which everyone loves, of course. I know you bought it money from the course. <laughs> Not really. Um, so um, the thing about, about, about that whole thing was Microsoft was a Xbox was quite a hardcore console. It was like a you know an 80 to 24, you know. And they bought us to provide broad appeal content. So which, you know, looks like a good move on paper, really. Like, you know, we were making good broad appeal, good broad appeal games with that. that and uh, we could be relied upon to produce that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, we were kind of the only people that they had that was doing that. There was nobody else really apart from us doing that for the Xbox. So we couldn't produce enough content. It was impossible to get enough games out of the, the people we had there. So we couldn't do it, you know. So, and they never really pushed the games, Microsoft. They always kind of said, oh, you want to do one with them. But they knew the money was in Halo and all those other stuff. So they never really did. So we got sort of pee masks going on. That was a bit unfair, I think. So that went on, you know, Xbox 360 came along and it just, you know, I think Rare did produce, I think Nuts and Bolts, and I think that the people in the other games are good games, and then, you know, people didn't take time to play them an awful lot, but I just never look at my son, who loves that, he, didn't know, he doesn't know that I did the music for those games, he didn't know when he started playing them, and he really likes his friends, so all like Nuts and Bolts, and they all love the arts. I think there was definitely mileage in those games for a younger audience, but Max just never pushed it, so it just got by the way, and the Pinata people did about a million and a half tickets for that. Banjo and some balls put in 500,000. So, unfortunately, I'm just a bit of a, you know, it was just turned out badly for Rare. I think. And I'm, you know, I'm a fierce advocate for Rare. I'm totally loyal to that company. I think they're the best company in the world. You know, the people that I know are fantastic. And there's still a lot of talent in there. I still feel that Microsoft are really using them and pointing in the wrong direction. And a lot of the good guys that they have left. And, you know, uh, it really breaks my heart to see the Rare the way it is now. And it broke my heart to believe up. You know, I could probably crap out it. Um, you know, just having to leave that company was just a, an awful decision to make. I just I loved it so much. It was such a big change to my life being there and being part of those great projects, you know, being very receptive of us. But I, I kind of half heartedly loved the jobs over the last couple of years looking at what it was about. I really fancy coming to the US and trying to do, you know, go to the US and see what it's like. And I applied a couple of places and never really followed it through. But big, huge games sort of said, oh, yeah, why don't you come over for us, you know, like that. So, I came up to Baltimore. I wasn't really concerned about how big the studio was, how popular they were, how fantastic they were. I wanted to make sure that I felt like they were full of passion for games and really vibe and, you know, were dedicated to doing it. And I felt like I could make a contribution to that company. And I really felt like that like games. I really thought that they were full of good people and I liked the attitude and the way they were. So I thought, well, I might as well buy them. So I just took the job there. So I resigned to Rare with floods of tears for weeks on end. Uh, and then uh, just took my family and came to America. So we got to produce games, and um, I was originally hired not to do music, but I was hired to do to, to, to be the audio director. Um, there was two projects at the time, I was supposed to oversee two projects. Um, and it went on a little bit, so I thought, you know, since you're here, 
why did he do the music? Uh, they had actually um, contracted it out to a company called Danny Medi for Gavin Eden in Germany, who was supposed to do the music for what he's now reckoning. Um, and they met the guy, he was a nice guy, and I thought it was going to go great. I thought, well, you know, I don't have to compose, so what? But he asked me to do it, so I well, fair enough, I'll do it. So I started doing that. And then, of course, TGQ had a bunch of bad times and decided to, decided to sell the huge game. So we got a, a, an emergency meeting called in the meeting area, we all went in there, and said, I'm going to put a cushion down. 50 days, because you no, have over, over 50 people, you get 30, I think it's 30 days, the law is, it's called the war notice. You get 30 days to get shut down. I was like, I'm on a visa, after the company shuts, 10 days I'm kicked out of the country. So I was like, oh my god, that's too dreadful, you know. So, no job, I've, I've mailed the rest, I can't come back to red, please, you know, uh, and then replied. Uh, and um, so, um, thankfully, uh, Kurt Schilling stepped in at the last minute and bought the company, because he had 30 years, he does with Providence, uh, not Providence, was in um, Farrah, somewhere in Boston, as well, uh, and uh, stepped in, so we'll buy you, he bought the company, and then uh, we started again. So, we, the game was kind of going, I've been going for a couple of years, but we did that, and we sort of started again with the, the Copernicus, the MMO, we kind of put that into what we already had. And here we are now, so the game went gold, literally on the fifth, so that means it's at the gold master, means it's a gold master company, because they pressed the disc on that book, so that's, that's pressable, so that's, that's being done right now. So, um, here I am, so Reckoning should be out, it's going to be out for a bit of seventh. Um, used by me and Mark Cromer has done some things on there as well. Um, I'm in charge of the, the only director's job, his job is to make, I'm like the filter if you like, I'm the kind of the, the, the shit filter, so everything goes through me and I have to kind of say I like that, I like that, I change that, I change that, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to hold the, the audio vision for the, for the title, so I think sounds shit, I think it's uh, So yes, that's, that's where we are now, so um, you know, it's been very exciting to reckon, it's definitely a departure for me, it's a, it's a gigantic game, I've had to run a very big um, orchestral score for that game. Called it in Prague again because it put out two pretty high games and managed to put some goals in Prague with the same orchestra because they're a great bunch of people and I know they're very well over there. Um, and I've really enjoyed doing it because it's the biggest things I've ever written. I, mean, I do like writing big boss pieces, I don't think I've ever done anything like that. Uh, my boss pieces tend to be a little bit um, over the top and I can't manage it. Um, I've tried to write things that are gigantic for this game so I'm very proud of it. Um, and I hope that when it comes out, you like it, you'll write it away. So otherwise, I'll be out of job. <laughs> so, uh, that'd be great. The cook shut down and be all over, so I'll be, uh, I'll be a bum. Um, so, um, yeah, that's it. That's, that's basically my career today. Um, uh, I'm very old now, of course, very grey haired. Uh, I'm still trying, so that's my, uh, that's my story. So, I don't know if I can ask any questions, anyone here? That's my, um, the other first person to ask Um, You have a lot of different styles of just writing. Uh, even just your orchestral stuff, you have a lot of separate sort of moods that you can write in, like for Banjo Kazooie stuff, you have the umba kind of stuff going on, for Viva Pinata it was like more ambient and relaxed. Do you have a favorite um, style to write in when it comes to orchestral music? I've got to say, I think Viva Pinata, I, I like writing that an awful lot. I do like that kind of, I call it 20th century English music, like Paul Williams, Elder. I like that a lot. Um, so that was my attempt to sound like that. And I was very fortunate that the, a lot of times in games you don't get to write what you want to write. You, you, need, to, you, know, you need to write what's right for the game, whether you like it or not. I've, been, I've, been, I've liked all the stuff I've written, but I really like the Viva Pinata a lot. Especially Viva Pinata 2, which don't really bother that because it was like a, you know. But the, the ice and desert levels of Viva Pinata 2 probably are my favorite pieces I've written on my own. I can certainly sit there and cry to the house. <laughs> cry uh, You know, so um, yeah, I'd say, yeah, I do like that. But you know, I've got to say, it's good fun, you know, writing music for games. It is, generally speaking, pretty good fun, you know. So I do like, I do like all the styles I've done, and I like to be able to write different styles. I think it's very important as a game composer to be able to write different styles, because game designers will just ask you to write in a style and expect you to be able to do it. I think the thing that I do badly is like dance music. I'm very bad at that. If I do a dance music, I'd probably be appalled at that. Yeah, you have to learn like a whole new program just to make it sound okay. Well, I just, I don't get it. You know, I'm too old, you know, so I just think like, I'm a bit younger than but. Um, so I don't think I do that very well. I think I can probably get around most of the things. I think I'm having a metal background and playing in a soul band and doing orchestra and stuff. I've had a reasonably good education. Well, not education, but I've been exposed to a lot of kind of music. So I think, I'd say, sorry about that's a big, big waffle, but be with me out here. That's the answer for that one. To be honest, you, sir. You talk about if you're writing shame when you're writing on
Yeah, I mean, I've got to say, I don't think my process for writing music has changed at all. I don't think my process for making audio for games has changed at all. I think, I think you get a lot of shit talked about that. Um, I don't do anything different than I did when I started. I just sit with a, some kind of sequencing package and some sample set and try to write the shit. That's it. And it's nice to, be, you know, to go from, you know, Golden Air, which was like tiny, I was looping symbols because I couldn't, the, the, the cave was too long to get into memory, you know, you know to write in full orchestral stuff now. It's bizarre. But, you know, if someone had told me I was a better man than to be around across the music and, you know, this time I'd be better than you know, so. But I think I've been lucky that I played in orchestras from like 10 to 22. So I didn't know how this sounds. It did, didn't scare me at all. I, I was, I, you know, I, I don't find it scary at all. I think for some people it is scary because it's an unknown quantity. You know, people don't do, get to do that very often. So, you know, that was, um, I don't think it changed much. It's nice to be able to use that stuff. And I've got some, I'm, I'm a bit of an orchestral purist when it comes to orchestra. I like it to be pure. I don't like adding in lots of funny noises. I don't like adding in some parts. I just don't like doing that. Uh, it. I'm probably an old fart for that, but I just, that's what I, I don't like it. I don't, I hate it when you hear like, you know, some orchestral Bolivian flute playing something along with it. I don't like it. And I know everybody else probably does, but I just don't like it. I'm sorry, I just, I, I just like to have. I, mean, I think in Wrecking I've used one thing called the water foam, which is like a, it's a circular thing that's got, got rods on it, which gives me a bizarre noise. I've used that, so... Oh, that's, that's my last class I've got. <laughs> so, you know, I do sort of like the orchestral stuff. I mean, you know, you know, if I had to write a perfect dark tomorrow, I'd just go back to the... I just think you have to do what's right for the game, you know. So reckoning is a big sort of Lord of the Rings EQ, like Harry Potter situation for me, or part of it, you say. Um, you know, so it needed an orchestral soundtrack, that's why I did it that way. But if, I, I just do what the game requires of me, so I think you have to do that. But it's, it, obviously, it's wonderful to be able to. I use like the Game Symphonic Library for the strings, for the, sorry, for the orchestra, which is a bit quite expensive. It's the older version, it's not the new one, so it's a, it's a quite expensive library. It's good. I have Hollywood strings, I use those. Um, so I use that a lot, but you know, bear in mind that my MIDI orchestral demos sound pretty good, but I know it's going to get done by orchestra, so I don't have to make them fantastic. So I don't spend time polishing it so it sounds fantastic, like it can sound. Some people do fantastic orchestral stuff, MIDI, I don't. The my sources don't. Um, so, but I've got the luxury to be able to do it with the orchestra in the end, so, you know, so I do know that. If I had to do it myself, I'd probably spend longer on it. But I'm a bad polisher. I like, I, my, I'm a real sort of harmony and tuning person. I like to do that more than anything else. I can't be asked to polish it. Um, really. That's, a, that's, my, that's my answer again, but that's my answer. <coughs> Is that anything that you've asked anybody else? Sir? You say that most of the time you have like the section of the game in front of you that you're writing the music for, or do you have to kind of wing it a lot of the time? Sometimes, sometimes not. So I think, you know, you do get design documents. But you know, it's still like, you know, <coughs> you get some design assistance, you're right, it's a lot of level. It's, a, it's, you know, it's, an, it's a forest level, you still look at that, and you know, you know what you're going to do. You have to see it to know what you're going to do. You know, it's like, it's still, even though it's very overblown and pompous now, it's still basically, this is a lava level, this is a nice level, this is, you know, it's the same, you should be never You never change the feel, you know, but let's face it, it, does it change? No. You know, you know, you know you're going to get an ice level and a lava level, you know, something like that. Um, so, yeah, so sometimes, you, can, you know, I think if, if I have to write something that's, Cinematics are good as well, but you have to have the cinematic in front of you. You've got to score, to, you've got to get the movie and score it in time, to, and it's got to be, it's got to look to it. So that, that is something that you already have to see. But I think when it comes to writing tunes for a level, it's just like, this is the forest, you know, off you go. That's, <laughs> that's what I do. I mean, <coughs> so. uh, yeah, I have a rather interesting question. Good. Uh, that's, <laughs> uh, Banjo Kazooie and Banjo Tour are two of my favorite games for the 64. Mm -hmm. And um, having a bit of an ear from music myself, I noticed something very interesting. For all the world between those two games, with the exceptions of Mayhem Temple and Witchy World, all the world themes are in the key of C major. Did you do that on purpose? Uh, it's just because I'm a very, very bad PM. <laughs> 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 Seriously, I'm just, I'm such a shit keyboard player. <laughs> so, I just, just, I just, I don't know, <laughs> it's not the white notes, isn't it? It's quite easy, it's like, so, yeah. that was it, that's honestly the answer. Alright. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. You said you're uh, essentially expected to write the styles, so how do you, how do you overcome that obstacle? I mean, not every composer is able to just smoothly move from style to style. Is there any, like, exercise? Not, not really, I, I guess listen, listen to lots of music. I've got to say I'm pretty bad at that. I'm, you know, I'm really bad at jumping on the latest fad. I'm so bad at picking up new music. I hate it. If someone says to me, this is great, I've got shit. It took me ten years to think it's good. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm appalling at that. Robert Beeman is fantastic at that. He, he's always getting used to it. He, he 
it just lives for it, and I just cannot be bothered. So I'm just an old twat who doesn't want to do that stuff. Um, so, but I think you know you, you just have to. I listen, listen to the radio a lot, probably more so than listen to CDs or anything else. I just, I've got that's got a new car, first new car in my life ever. I've got that serious radio thing, so you can go through all the same, and I just constantly hop and hop and hop. And hop. Like, I pick up bits of everything. But I'd say I'm bad at the modern music. I think that's probably where I'm not good at not, not good at crap. You know, so, but you know, it's got to be like the artist's a good example. Like, I had to write all those romance dance pieces, and one of the artists said, Would it be a great idea if we had a different style of music for every single album? So that was 90 albums. So I had to write 90 different 20 second romance dances. And it's quite good fun because, like, usually by 20 seconds, you've got an idea anyway, because I usually have. So I just, you know, you get to 20 seconds, so that's pretty stuff, right? So, you know, so I mean, I, there was like heavy metal to rock, to ska, to punk, to boring dancing, you name it, I had to do a lot. It was great fun to do that, you know. So, some of the time, just listen, listen, to, the, listen, listen to it and try and edit it. Uh, to, one of the pieces was a, they, they wanted to be like Prodigy, Firestarter. Um, I'm not even going to that stuff. Um, and <coughs> so I just listened to that track. And unfortunately, <laughs> um, so did Prodigy. Uh, I didn't usually, Microsoft have got this, they have a very strict legal team that vet anything that I, anything you would do that, that could be, they could get sued for. And um, they're very, they, they are completely able, on the slightest stupid bloody thing that you do, it sounds like this, you know, it, it, because it's no, it's not an exact science, they can just buggy you up to it. I bet them thought they didn't let that one go, unfortunately, and they got sued for that. <laughs> I was most proud of that. Uh, so, um, I think they paid on five grand in the end. Because the Microsoft would never go to court because they're scared of, getting, scared of losing and, and losing badness and they will settle out of court. But I think the rest of it got through. I mean, you know, there was a, I think the Penguins or something, was it the Penguins or the Levins had a, had a James Bondy sounding mass dance. I had to change because the last call went, duh, 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 like in the Bond films. So you can't have that. I said, what I say? So you, can't, you can't copyright Britain. It's, it's, not, it's not cheap. Yeah, it's seven notes before it becomes an issue. Yeah, yeah. I said, I said, no, no, you can't have that. So I had to make it duh, duh, duh. And then, like, I mean, you know, I just thought it twice. You know. um, there was other pieces like that. I did a, the pictures are, uh, do a work of photograph. It's supposed to be Duran Duran girls on the film. And I did it something that I thought sounded quite like it, but close enough. They wouldn't know that pass. I had to change it to something else. Just, I had to change four or five. I, mean, I hate doing it. Um, but I just, I did it. Uh, and I, I thought about it. Don't worry about that. I, I lost it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so I think you just have to be prepared to run any, any style that gets asked because, you know, some of the art designers just will ask you for anything and they're just expected to do it. Okay, let's check that. I think get to write lots of styles, listen to lots of music and, and practice it. Pick a piece of music, listen to it and write and, and emulate it. That's important. But also, you must always remember that no matter what kind of music you particularly like and what you aspire to may not be right for the game. You have to write what's right for the game. And I think a lot of composers forget about that. A lot of composers, you know, I like dance music, because so they just write like dance for everything. It's just, that's a stupid idea. It's just not going to work. You know, you have to be prepared to buckle down and just do what the design. Because at the end of the day, the lead designer is the guy who's going to be, he holds all the cards in that game. It's, it's his property. And you do what he wants. You are employed to write music for somebody. You are they're paying your wages, you do what they tell you. And you know, I've, I've got no qualms about bending them backwards to do that. If you are at home writing a symphony, you do what the fuck you want, you know, it's up to you. You know, and you, and you took this for, for, for you yourself and you don't care who likes it. But if you're employed by anybody for anything, then you do as they tell you. That's, that's obvious to me. So that's what I'd recommend for composers. Write lots of people, get your sources of music and do what's right for the game, not what's right for you, what's right for the game. That's my two biggest things I'd say. So. I had two questions, is that okay? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, my, uh, my first one is, uh, the couple times that you've done voices in games that you've composed for... Lots of times. Is, uh, okay, well, is that something that, like... Because I, I know the cast of all the Rareware games are typically just whoever's around the studio to, like, jump in the booth. Like, is that is that fun for you and everybody else to just kind of screw around and do like weird little sounds yeah, and all the characters? Yeah, I did, I mean, I've got to say, I can't remember, I've done lots and lots of tough voices. I mean, all, lots of tough, all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, but when it came to the from the art, it was still animals. And um, it was obvious that I mean, you couldn't use real animals, it had to be human beings making funny noises for that game. Mm -hmm. and so I had to start to the team, look, you lot need to do some voices for this game. And they were all a bit hesitant at first and didn't want to do it. But once it started, it became a fight. 
And I used to send an email and say, right, alligator, and they the first person back would be the person that got chosen for the alligator. <laughs> he used to go, they used to get mad, he used to go mad dragon. And so they all absolutely loved it. That's how they cast for Pokemon, by the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it really works, and they absolutely, they all fall to be certain animals at the end of the day. Right. But before that, it was usual, me and Brian's emails, great emails, I used people to divorce for all that stuff. So. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, uh, have you seen and what do you think of the uh, versions of your songs on the internet, like, with lyrics? Excellent. Yeah? Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, inappropriately, excellent. I mean, people remix my stuff do it far better than I do. And it's, it's, it, I've never, it, it's incredibly humbling to see that. And the people who take the time to do it, I just find that an amazing thing. And it's just fantastic. And there's been some amazing versions of my stuff. I just think, Christ, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, fantastic. So I've looked at what was in the level and decided what I needed to do with it. So um, on the first game, Magic Kazooie was good at 16, the one mini file, so I had to kind of allocate channels to certain areas and all that kind of stuff. But, but by Banjo Tui, a program guy there called Will Bryan worked out we could link two mini files together, it wouldn't really sync, so I had 32 channels. So I could do more, so I can link you So I had a lot of channel games and I to different areas. So there's more channel based on that. Um, so yeah, so it would be up to me to decide. Um, you know, the correct nerds wouldn't listen to it. it. But it got to the point where I was very fortunate. When I first started there, people would vet what I did a lot. But by the time they trusted me in any I got I got quite a free hand with me, so I could be, I could be, let's say, get on with the ground and show the good. And it kind of, you know, it, most of the time it was. <laughs> Not all the time. So, you know, I had to change a few things. Um, but yeah, so that, that's basically, yeah, I, I, I'd take them up myself to look at it and say, what's there, what's that, I'll try and do something with that. So, yes, Chuck. Oh, yes, my gosh. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Pippa Dark, uh, What's been your favourite game to compose for? Um, it probably has been for you, but really, I would say. Um, I reckon it's been fantastic. I mean, it's, it's an immense project, and it's been really good to do it, and to get to write that immense music was fantastic. So, but, you know, I, I don't... I, I've enjoyed all of it, I've got to say. I've got little high points, but it's been really, really good. All, of, all my career so far, I've been so lucky to work on such great games. And, you know, I'm so fortunate that... I, it's hard to pick one of them. So. Um, out of all the uh, rare games that have come out over the past you know, decades or so, the ones that you have not worked on, which one would you work on and why? That's a good question, actually. I don't know about that. Um, you know, I don't think I like the other games. <laughs> um, Robbie, did it. Robbie was perfect for Conquer. That was right up his street. He did a great job on that. Um, Dave Clinton did Perfect Dark Zero. Dave Clinton sort of started at Rare just as I was doing Perfect Dark, so I got him to help me out because I just had so much to do with Donkey Kong and Magic to it. He did like, most of the cutscenes, some of the, he did a couple of levels, and most of the multiplayer levels he did. Um, and I said to him, when well, comes to Twitter, like, Perfect Dark Zero, you can do it, because I knew it was going to be a complete disaster. <laughs> uh, so, um, um, he, he did a great job in that game. I really liked Dave's writing, it's brilliant. So I don't know really, I, I don't think I would have run. Jeff was German, I don't know, maybe. Um, no, I'm really, I'm happy with what I got, I think. Happy with my lot. I think, yeah, I'm quite, yeah, it's good. Right in the background, so. When you run for professional stuff, like for the you know, and the uh, game, uh, do you write your own sheet arrangements so you can have orchestrators or arrangers and do that based on the long dots? Right, yeah, so what I do is I do the new Pro Tools now. I used to always use Cubase, but I do switch to Pro Tools because Pro Tools is. I don't know why I really, it's, the MIDI is good enough, it used to be old, but it's good now, so it's got a decent layout. So, and I like to have some everything sat inside one program, it's quite nice. Um, so, I've got to say, my MIDI stuff is pretty accurate as to how, just because I'm used to orchestra, because I've played this since I was a kid, so it's pretty accurate as it's going to be, but I do use an orchestrator. I think, you know, I don't, you know when you use MIDI, MIDI stuff, you don't put expression marks and all that kind of stuff, you know, have, you know so you don't, you don't do that. I don't, I don't do it, I don't have the time, I've got the time to do it. Really. So, um, so, I've got Nick Ray, who's a fantastic orchestrator. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I, I would say my, I, I think I probably could do it, probably, and I, I do, all my voicings are correct, and I do use, you know, so it, it, it would look 
pretty like it, I think. Um, but sometimes he might just change the voice, and he might say, well, the bassoons, you know, I may have a cluster chord, and the bassoons is changing those bits to a compound chord, or whatever that is, but um, stuff like that. Um, so, so I've learned a little bit from that, you know, kind of thing, and I've learned more about woodwind, probably especially. Um, the voice is how to voice those, but how to get that kind of John Williams voice to the chord. I've learned that, especially this time. Um, so, yeah, about teaching orchestra, that's the that's 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 It's a very expensive thing. Of course, yes, of course, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I, when I think to myself, you know, from writing, you know, looping symbols and golden eye to going, cellos, but I thought you're too loud, please, you know, like, it's, like, you know, it's pretty, uh, you know, pretty, yes, I'm, pretty, I'm a composed me, do I say, you know, so, so uh, it's quite nice to do that, to do that stuff. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, all the recordings of all things that I've done, I think I make a point of going, because I think that, you know, there's always something that the orchestra will get wrong, and you miss a note, and you've got kind of goes to minute. Get the score out like this and go, oh, I think it, you know, that's a B flat, isn't it? It's still a B naturally, you know, so you, you know, you have to, because it's quite, I think being there for those moments is, it's worthwhile going. It's a long way to Prague. It's a lot, lot further for me than it was from the UK anyway. And it's, you know, six hours ahead, it's a shit time zone, and it's like, oh, you know, and you're there now in the morning going, you know, what time is it and all that. But, um, so, yeah, I think, it's, I think it is important to be there, especially if you, you know, to keep an eye on it all. Just to say things, that's a bit too loud, that's, you can do it, do the sync called Sam or something. It, it's a, it ties to anything, you can monitor it, you can monitor it live across the internet, and it's very high quality. Um, but it means that they start at nine and you're at three in the morning, you know. So I'd rather go, I think for the money it costs to go, it's not all, in, in, the, in the scheme of games budgets, you know, a few grand for my flights and hotels, not very much. You know, so I think, I think it's, even though I can't be asked to go um, when it's miles away, um, I think it is well worth going. And I think for those, for those moments, it's very important to go, yeah, just a minute and stop, there's some more notes there. Because, you know, once it's done, you can't go back and correct it. Costs, to get the orchestra back and all that costs a fortune. So, you've got, you know, to be able to do it, then it's important. So, I think, yes, I'll be in there. So. so, one of your earlier questions uh, was about the process, I guess. So, what is your process? Like, do you have, like, a general formula, or do you actually kind of use different processes and then use different results? Like, Not really. I've got to say, I just sit there and go, that's a C, and that's a B flat. And, you know, I'd, honestly, I just sit there and think about it and do it. I don't think there's any magical way to do that, you know, you know, I suppose like anybody who writes music, you, you know, if someone says to you, right, I want to write a piece of music that's a city, a city theme, it's a, it's a bit of an, an orange branch, it's got big spires and all that, you're going to, you're going to go, right, I'm going to use this, 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 you know, you're going to think of something straight away, and that's what I do. Um, so generally, if I'm going to write some kind of theme for something, I'll probably fiddle with a medley, med, medley, medley first, medley, medley, yes, yes, medley first, if I write some ambient, I'll probably fiddle with some chords, probably. You know, so like, reckoning is quite a dark game. It's, um, so I've got stacks and stacks of minor chords just going link to link to link to link to minor. And I knew I was going to do that for a start, you know, so sit and fiddle with it until it sounds good. Honestly, I thought I uh, And then for the thematic parts of reckoning, I've, I've got a main theme that I've written for the game and themes here and there, and I'll just use those. So I just really just sit until it sounds good. I've, I've got no magical process. You know, I've, I've, I've sat at rare, my longest time, I sat three days looking out the window. Couldn't write a note. That's the longest I've ever been without it. Finally, you know, it's ridiculous really, because it's not that bloody hard. It's just to come out to me. You know, it's not that difficult. But you know, I have, I have periods of time where you've got to sit and go, I've got a clue what I'm going to do. I don't know if that's it, my career. You know, I think every time you start a project, you think that. You, I think you, your technique's never good enough. Your mode your writer's never good enough. Your chords are never good enough. Because you hear somebody else much better than you go, oh, shit, they're brilliant, I'm shit. You know, so I don't think it's, that's the downside of being a, an artist, if you like. That, you know, you, you, you know there's always a billion people that are a billion times better than you. You just go, I don't know, I don't know what we do. Please, well, honestly. So, yeah, the part of the process with that system. Um, what do you do about times when you just have completely nothing of an artistic output? Like, I don't know if this happens to you or not, but for me, there'll be like a time of three or four months where I don't write anything at all, and I have no idea what to do about it. Well, I think that because I'm employed at a company, you know, I generally do have something to do but most of the time. At the start of the game, it's, it's, you know, it's going to be a little bit sparse, but I generally will have a roadmap of like, I need to write this many little pieces, this many so and so, so I know what I need to do. So, I, you know, I do have to sit there and do it. It's just a bit like a conveyor belt, really. It's not like you sit in the room and wait for the hand of the Lord to hand you a song, you know, like, you know, you know be inspired by something. You just got to sit there and it's a job, you know, you have to do it. So, I haven't had too much of that. As I say, three days before the long as I've gone, but I just can't think of a note to it. Um, I'm, you, I'm a really bad, as I say, I'm a bad publisher, so I do like to get the melody and all that chords together. 
you know, and I'll, that's what I really like to do with the rest of my cooking machine. I'm just sick of it by that point. Um, towards the end of the reckoning, I, I got an awful lot of music to write at the end of it. I was really panicking to get through it all. Um, so, you, you know, I, I, you can't please me. I hate it when I'm bored and I hate it when I'm, I, I like it when I'm busy, but then I'm stressed. So, like, you know, you, you just can't win. I just think it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think being an audio person in particular is a particularly bad job. Because it's always going to go, oh my god, I'm bored. Oh my god, I'm bored. That's how, that's, how my, that's how my life is. <laughs> so it's, there's no in between for me, so I don't fall on or fall off. I haven't got in between. So I just, I, you know, pisses me off, but what can I say? You know, I like it really, but I don't really as well. So I don't, I've never had, because, of, because of, I think for me, when I was playing rock bands or doing metal bands, it was a hobby then. You know, it was great to be in metal bands, it was a hobby. It was, it was, it was a whole pop artist, system was to bust it back my head as loud as I could, you know, that was my whole pop band. My life was to play fast as I could, as loud as I could, you know, all that. You know, then when I got it as a job, my hobby vanished because I'm doing it every day. I don't want to do it again. Back in mind. So you're doing it as a hobby, I presume. Yeah. Yeah. So it's nice to have that for me to have that kind of choice to go. Ah, oh, we do today, but I've just got to do it today. You know. So I think that's you know. So I can't give really the answer to the but that that's my thought process. So you know, I, I just, my life is I'm miserable most of the time. If you're anybody, you anybody you, you talk to the new and say, "God, grant such a miserable bastard," because I. <laughs> I always knew, I'm, I'm never happy. Um, I think it's, it's a curse of being, you know, somebody who's creative. Like anybody creative, I'm sure you all are new. It's a curse that they think it's never happy anymore. Um, so, yeah, so I always think that together. But usually I don't have that kind of time in which I, I've got the look to be able to sit there and not feel like I have to do it. So, yeah. this chapter is really nice. Um, yeah. You say. Um, what would you say is your uh, biggest influence as a composer? Like, uh, like a band or a closer? I've got a few. I think right now I'd say John Williams and Definite. I've listened to, I listened to, I kind of, I, I've spent maybe a year, probably, listening to the first three Harry Potter soundtracks um, in the car, back to back, on a constant rotation, never taking them off, <laughs> honestly. Um, because I really like, well, I spent a long time liking Daniel Fan a lot, I did like him a lot, I still do. Um, but I think about John Williams, I, I, I think he's a real composer. Um, he, he has these, I think it's easy to, to dismiss people like that these days. People, it seems to be the trend seems to be to be, to be moving away from melody and to get some kind of ambient thing. And I don't like that. Um, I like to write a tune. I'm, I may be just be old fashioned, but I, I, I may be, but I like to write melody. I like to have things that people can hook onto. And I still believe that most people like to hear a tune that they can sing to themselves, you know, obviously, or oh, whatever, I don't know. But, you know, and I think that's, that's what exists in the human thing. Um, like you think of the Batman, the Dashi Batman from Zimmer, it's got two notes to it. You know, I don't like that. I mean, everyone might think it's great, but I don't. I didn't mind the, the um, Inception thing, it's alright. Um, but I just like to retune, I really do, you know. And Williams, you know, you've got to think, he has these, I think you can overlook what he does. If you just get careful to his really big battle pieces or something that's got a lot of anime, a lot of stuff going on, he has these big thematic moments which blow your balls off. And then he's got like a, after that, it's just, I kind of call it tread water music, where it's very exciting, it's all over the place. If you listen to some of the Harry Potter battle sequences, or, you know, Quidditch matches, whatever, it's really, really, it's everywhere the music. And it's a big kind of, here's a theme, and here's a theme, and all that, it's a bit like that. And it took a while to learn, because it's, you, know, you go through so many ideas in such a like five seconds. So you need to write pieces of music that are that complex. With a thematic moment, which is quite easy, because it takes time. And then loads and loads and loads of just tread walk stuff, which is everywhere. It's exciting, it doesn't get in the way, the action. That's hard, I think. So it took a long time to listen to that this, this last year or so. I, I sort of think I've got, I'm nowhere near, nowhere, nowhere, nowhere near to think something, don't get me wrong. But I think I've got a little bit, <laughs> I can't, I've pulled a little bit out to go, I can have this little bit. You know. If I was 1%, I'm going to see if I'd be happy. You know, so like, um, yes, yeah, so I'd say that's, that's the thing that, that, that's, that I've learned a lot this year. Um, so, um, and in particular, Woodward, I know it's boring shit, but in particular, Woodward Voice, I've, I've learned a lot about that. Actually, um, that's, just, that's just listening to the scores over and over again. So, that's that. So. So, <clears throat> you said that you thought it was really important to write music that fits the tone of the game and not just what 
kind of music you like to write as a composer. Yeah. Have you ever come up with a tune while composing for a game that you liked but didn't really fit with that particular game that you got a chance to reuse later with a different one? Oh, yeah, well, you know, that happens. Uh, I suppose <laughs> with Dream, I brought all these dreams, so 100 pieces, all of them turned up later on. And I've, on my website, I've got some, some of the old Dream tunes on my website. It's grantkirkup.com, if you don't know that. Uh, there's some dream music on there. It, it's some of the old themes you'll, you'll hear that popped up in Donkey Kong and Banjo later. And the very main theme for Dream, which I, I kept, I liked it so much, I kept it right up to the open yard and used it in that. Um, so there's some of that stuff, yeah. Um, I did write, when Banjo first died, Banjo, the Mumbles Mountain and um, Trisha Trope Cove were different when I first wrote them. Um, Banjo, the Mumbles Mountain was a bit more jungly. And Trish Trust Cove had a bizarre sort of Beach Boys wipeout section in the middle of it. Um, <laughs> and I guess, uh, strange really, and I guess. Uh, so, um, and I have put those on my website, actually. The, well, the, the Trish Trust Cove, but it's all tunes on my website. Also, the Free Haiti Park, that, that was similar but different. And that's on my website too. I've, I've, I managed to find those mini files, I've managed to forget them back. There's a guy called Adam Vieira who's called Cool Boy Man, he's a, one of the community. He's, managed to break into the banjo ROM so he can play the music. Because I, I can't, if I had to get the mini files back from the banjo and play it again after my instruments, I haven't got that, I've got access to the something. So to have a run that actual banjo cartridge that he's got, he's managed to see he's been that stuff for me. So that's my website. So some of those tunes I did change. I've I got to say, I've been lucky at that. There was stuff I've written that people have liked. I've been very lucky at that. Chris Tampa didn't like Mumbles Mountain and didn't like uh, Trish Trump Coast, so I changed those. I got a smile about it, I was going, oh, bastard. Another thing about game is that composers is, you asked about this earlier on, was that never get, to, wasn't it? never get too attached to what you write. Because, because no matter how much you like it, if the game doesn't like it, you can, you can talk to them to the blue in the face, say, no, but this is great, this is great, this is going to happen. It's never going to change. You, you know, I like Metallica, you like Lady Gaga, you know what, it's never going to change, is it? You know what I mean? Actually, I do like Lady Gaga very much. But, like, you know what I mean? You just can't, if someone doesn't like it, you know, no amount of talking to them is going to choose their minds. You know, so you have to always be the best case composer. If, if, no matter how great you think it is, if they get shit, that's it. Just go, right, right. don't even bother, I'll just go right up five and I'll do it again. Oh, and then the people have my, we have uh, employee reviews every year at companies where your boss tells you what he thinks of you. And our studio manager is my direct report, if you like. So Grant said, I've never had an audio director like you who just goes, yeah, I'll change it. I've never known this. I can't. He said, some of your experience from doing it all these years, you know, I think it'd be a fight for everything. But if you just say to you, Grant, it's crap, change your arm. And I can't believe it. So why do you do that? I said, well, you know, why not? You pay my wages. I can argue to blue in the face. You don't have to change your mind. So I just go, rather than just sense of the heart, I can run. I just go around and do it. So I'd say that. Thing. Yes. So. Any video games that you really admire? You know what? I'm really bad at listening to other video games, and I don't play a lot of video games these days. I'm, you know, it's, it's boring, really. I've got a son who's nine, a daughter who's five. My son's addicted to video games, um, so I do to watch him play. I was a big World of Warcraft player, really, or well, biggish in the UK. Um, I was big, I was part of the game and all that stuff, and I used to like doing all that. Um, and some of that was all right, but I'm, I'm, sick, I'm, I'm such a finicky person about music. And I know, I just know what I like, and I'm so bad at picking up new music, I just, I just don't do it, I'm bad at it. I, I always hear something and I'm going, is that how you Am I? No, no, no. Yeah, I'm, 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 but like, I'm so bad at that. And I always listen to music, oh God, why did they do that? Oh God, why did they do that? Oh, where's the tune? Oh, no, it's just all bloody chords, oh, for Christ's sake. And I'm always, <laughs> like, you know, and like, you know, I, I'm a total Harry Potter, I love it to death, and I just think it's fantastic. I know everything's a crap, but I think it's great. Uh, and when William stopped doing it, the other guys took over, and I thought they were all awful. Without exception. And they're all great composers, they probably much better than me, but I didn't like it. So I just thought, well, why the bloody hell didn't you use a Williams theme? Why did you do that? If I got the chance to write Harry Potter, I'd think, Christ, am I might give it that thing, you know, I can't believe it. I just, and, and, and Alexander like did a test plan in the last two films, and I didn't like that either. I know he's a great composer, and he's much better than me, but I don't like it. You know, and I just, I'm bad at that, and I always model it. And I'm learning an awful lot. The, last, the best thing that I heard, and it's quite, it's good for you, that was a film called Stardust, that came out with, um, and um, I managed to carry the music for that, and I thought that was fantastic. I listened to that, and thought, Christ, I think here's someone that gets it. He brought some pretty fantastic tunes, it's really well put together. And I thought, and I bought the film, and I don't do that very often. I thought it was fantastic. 
I really, that's the last great thing. I bought the Tintin soundtrack accident to them by Williams recently, and that is really good. And I've got to say, I think Williams has been out of the limelight a little bit for a few years, really, even in some serious pieces like, you know, for uh, Shooters and Stalker stuff from, you know, the ball, all that kind of stuff. And it was so nice to buy a CD by him and put on and go, Christ, he's a real composer, back again, doing what he's really good at. Write some great tunes, some great, exciting music. And I just, it's just, you know, I don't do that very often, you know, back sounds but I thought that was fantastic. But really, when I go see a movie these days, I'm always let down. I just, I just think of the same Zimmer stuff cloned by somebody else over and over again. I'm just, I'm so sick of hearing that. I just, I just think, well, someone just burst that bubble and just fuck it off. I'm just so tired. Um, but you know, I'm probably the minority because I think most people that's fantastic. So I just think, you know, I don't make any excuses for it. I just don't like it, um, and I just wish that it would change. You know. Williams is 80 years old, isn't he? He's going to go to the Super And Christ Almighty, who's going to fill his boots? I don't know. I will, yes, so, um, you know, it just, um, you know, it depresses me really. I, you know, I'm, I don't know, maybe that's the way it's going, and I'm, I'm just an old fart who dislikes the others, I don't know, so that's about to say. So, there we go. So, there we go. My on. voice is destroyed, and my questions are really worried, so I might start cracking as if I'm 11 years Okay. Um, so let's. Anyways, um, in modern ages, you know, you you master music, make it sound good. Now we can't exactly say this for the N64 USF files that you know you wrote for the Zooey, right. and especially for Donkey Kong Land or the Game Boy. You know, you don't really master Game Boy. Music. No. But uh, when it comes to you know modern music, um, I just have two questions. First of all, is uh, do you handle the mastering of your music? And two, uh, what would you, what kind of advice would you give to me, uh, who is terrible at mastering music, but I like to compose? Right. Well, I'm bad at mastering too. I never do it really. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a bad polisher. I hate. I can't be bothered to polish anything. I like to do the melody now. That calls us my best thing. Try to hold down. Da -da 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 -da. Then I can't be bothered to mix it. Well, that's like that. I'll do. <laughs> uh, so, but with me, because of the last four games that I've done, like Chupinatas, Nuts and Bolts, and um, Reckoning, are all for orchestra, and I love to do that. So, there's a guy in the Britain, in Britain called Gareth, uh, I forgot his second name, uh, but he, he's mastered all those. He, the people in Prague that I use, there's a little team, there's Nick Ray, and there's a guy called James Fitzpatrick, who's a contractor, and Gareth, his name, Williams. Um, he makes it so he makes it nice. He's a, a, mi a mixer master, which is quite a lot of information that you get to do that. Um, and he's done lots of stuff. There's lots of stuff. Yeah, sure um, of course, he's he did that, so I, I wouldn't do that. I've got to say, I think it would be not that hard, at this point, to bring bollocks. It's not that hard to, make, to master orchestra stuff. But when you're doing it midi, midi, the MIDI orchestra, you've got, to, you've got to try and funny about volumes and all that stuff and velocities. You know, when you get real players, they're going to crescendo and decrescendo by themselves. You haven't got to find that sample and put it in and mix it in the best of so they do it as they go along. So I think if you get the mix right, if you just pick your fingers up there and say when they're playing it, they're going to do the rest of them. They're going to go loud, quite loud, quite loud, through that day. So there's no, 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 there's nonsense. Nice. You know, so that's a bit easier, I think. If I had to do something, a, a kind of a modern soundtrack now, that was some popular music or something else, I'd just have to, I'm going to hire something I don't know, I don't, I don't have to go myself. I could probably get, I'd probably get make something reasonably sound all right, but not great. I'm not ready to do it either, so that's what I don't know. Okay, well, thank you, because uh, I released my first album a couple of years ago, and it was full of clipping, and it's really bad mastering. No, so. I, I don't think you're, you're alone, don't I think, honestly, I think, no, I'm, I'm crafty, so, uh, what can I say? I'm in the same boat as you. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, you had mentioned being finicky about music, and I'm the same way, I'm always, like, listening to all this different stuff. There's always a Hollow Note CD and an MJ Cole CD in my car. Right. What are your go-to jams? I go to what? Your go-to jams, you know? Oh, jam, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, that's a, okay, you're supposed to word, I'm old. Uh, yes, I say, yes. <laughs> I say, what's your favorite tune, sir? That's what you say, didn't you? Okay. Um, but look, you know, I'm a bit of a, a bit of a split, because I'm, I'm a big metal fan, I've always been a big metal fan, so, but like, it's not the new stuff, it's probably, I love Green Drive to Death, I think right, right up until Empire, I didn't like Empire from that point, but up in Voyage for Order and Minecraft are phenomenal albums, and still do those now. 
I did like Maiden a lot, Priest a lot, you know, a lot of the British metal bands like Metallica, all that kind of stuff, you know, big fan, I'm a huge, 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 huge fan. Um, and Halford B. John, you know, passed out with excitement. Um, you know, so that, but then I do listen to, you know, a lot of orchestral stuff, not a lot, but it's a little kind of Vaughan Williams Elgar, I know I think Vaughan Williams did Symphony Elgar, Kakenga, which are Elgar, and many variations, Delius, like Kalinda, it's just a little shit that I like. That I listen to, I listen to quite a lot. Um, you know, and I, you know, I do, I do love Lady Gaga. I mean, I've got to say that for me, someone like her, what well, I remember her, she'd get up, she'd get on the piano, play a fucking song and sing it. And that, I think that's such an amazing thing for popular artists these days. Any of these twats in the charts, you can get to go, they can't, they can't do anything without auto tune and the rest of it. Like, you know, she can get up and sing a song with a piano and it'd be good. And I admire that a lot. And she drinks some good tunes. So, despite the nut of the tears, you know, I do <laughs> think she's. Fantastic, you know. Um, so I'm trying to think what I've got in the car at the moment. I've got all the Williams. I've got one CD and everything. I've got three Williams hard on the CD on one CD with the new Tintin soundtrack. I've listened to that. I've got my own hard drive full of old crap in the car, and I've got the, the Sirius radio. And I go through, I flip through that a lot. Most of these rock channels, I suppose, Bone Yard and is it Hair Nation. The Hair Nation, my dear. So uh, I like that. No lipstick though. Um, so. Um, Yes, that's that, honestly. I've got, I think my music taste is pretty narrow, really. I'm, I'm, I'm appalling at picking up new music. I do, I'm so bad at it. I hate anything new. If someone's a mixed down now, I'll the shit. It leaves me 10 years. But I'm also, my, my father was a, um, a massive 50s dance band, Frank Sinatra fan. So Frank Sinatra still for me is a big, I like him a lot. You know, I still think to myself, he went in the studio and sang the song once, and that was it. And it's pretty well in tune. There's no other tune. He's got him sang it. I mean, you know, how many people uh, how, many, how many artists can do that? Just go, hey, toilet mate, come and sing this song over here. And he gets what sings it, it's fantastic. You know, that's a rare art. I don't, I don't know anyone can do that these days. So, that's my go-to jam. <laughs> I remember that word. Tell my kids. Yes, say. So. Uh, what was the morale like when uh, when Rare split from Nintendo when you joined, when Rare joined up with Microsoft? Was well, it was very cheaper at the start. Everyone thought it was great. We all thought it was great. We all thought, yeah, Max, I've got lots of money, it's going to be fantastic, it's going to go really well. Uh, and it didn't. Uh, so, uh, it went all right at the start, but I... It's very business, or what, that's not, but they can't run games companies. Every company that picked up had a shut up, you know, name it. You know the company, they, they, they're bought and closed. You know, I'm amazed they're still there. Bungie have been lucky to get away. You know, um, I just don't think they do that very well. I think that... that the minute you can... If you, if you think about the death that the, the Max have done, the minute you go from, from the dev studio to the first run of the Maxwell Ladder that's outside of the game studio, all games normally cease to exist. So, like, the further up the chain of Maxwell you get, the people, the people at the top, they know fuck all about games. I just know about sales and money. I've got a fucking clue. So, like, how are they going to, you know, try to tell somebody that Bantic Zeros and Bolts is worth promoting when Hale sat there and you got marketing going, look, what's good for my career? Stick in my life in Bantic Zeros or just get on the Hale about my game? Bantic Zeros. Ten million sales, fuck all. Halo! <laughs> it's easy, it's easy. So, like, that's what happens. So, in a way, I, I think that the indie gaming scene may well save games. Because I think games have got too corporate, and too overblown, and too many publishers like Alien, Activision. Mind you, I do love the A because they put it on the They don't They get these big corporate entities. They've got people at the top who've got fucking no idea what goes on in the game. No idea about it. So that's my grab. And it, when Max first took over, thought it was going to be great, fantastic, and it just slowly went <laughs> down this morning. And it's a, a word is now rare. Ironically, sports is rare's biggest seller under Microsoft, which breaks my heart. Um, you know, the uh, million sales, and I think rare are going to be stuck with Lenny Connect for Christ knows how long. You know, and rare put forward some ideas about new games when I was still there. Could have been great, but Microsoft didn't believe Rare could produce a core market title. Now, I find that astonishing and massively insulting. Rare been making games for 25 years, so something like a crap, a, a, a massive market games, but I've sold 25 million games. That's just me, never mind the company. I mean, you know, how can somebody like that say, actually, tell you what, that was great, but you did that wrong. This is how you do it, like this. This is how you're supposed to do it, and it's shit. You know, which, which, Brian, which, 
I'm just, you know, it, it, honestly, I, I, get, I get really angry about it, and it pisses me off to think that's what I left. You know, so I think Microsoft have got the money in the front and the resources to do whatever, whatever they want. And they should give Rare a chance of making a core market title without the fucking connect piece of shit. Proper game. And it, and it blow the world away. Because there's still people there that are good. I know there is. Not lots of them, but there are. And that's my problem with Rare. They should let Rare do what they do best. And not make a piece of, piece of shit like they do now. So that's my, my speech of today. I think that's it. I've done my hour.